know, I just like doing exactly what it is that I get to do, which is travel the country on a, on a weekly basis and, and meet interesting people. And quite often, you know, I, I haven't experienced that. If it wasn't on my bucket list, in hindsight, it would have been. You know, I went to the Windsor International Air Show and, and uh, flew in a biplane with a pilot who was in his 80s. And we did the, the loop-de-loop, yeah. you know, in one of those canvas biplanes with the two open cockpits and the sticks. That turned out to be one of the greatest days of my life. It's, uh, and uh, it's something I never even considered. I didn't even know you could do, still. <laughs> I didn't know who, who would even fly those planes, a guy in his 80s. A number of times I've shot with members of the Canadian Forces and uh, you know we were coming out of a, a pretty difficult time for members of the Canadian Forces but I always found those personally satisfying. Um, you know there's there's a lot you know lobster fishing in uh, New Brunswick was just uh, a tremendous group of people and and one of those perfect shoots like you know all the elements that make a good shoot is when you get to show off a beautiful part of the country to the rest of the country we had that in spades it was stunning um, really funny, interesting people who work hard, and uh, and that all that comes across on camera. Um, yeah, that's all. When all those elements come together, that's what I consider a great piece. I'm I'm always amazed at how hard people work for a living. That's for sure. Um, much harder than I do. That's for sure. <laughs> Lobster fishing is a perfect example. Um, you know what? I just I, I like talking to those people, and uh, I don't know if it's a reflection of where I came from in Newfoundland, but certainly. Uh, you know, my street was a pretty blue-collar street, I suppose, but, uh, you know, you don't have to look very hard for someone who works hard for a living in Newfoundland, but, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I just like talking to those folks, you know, and making and turning it into great television, you know, or television that people find interesting is, is, is a pretty big privilege, and it's always interesting when they're just right there. It's not like I'm doing groundbreaking television. It's just no one else bothers to go talk to lobster fishermen, I mean, you know. It's not like they haven't been there for a long time. Everyone has an opinion on auto workers. Everyone has an opinion on the auto industry. Everyone has an opinion on, you know, the, the, you know, the unions. Everyone has, but really, most people in the country, they don't know an auto worker. They've never been to that town. They don't know anyone in that union. They don't know how the business works. But yet, we all have this opinion, which is based on a number of pundits who have been, like, spouting business about them. And so it's good to go and, uh, and put those folks on television. Well, people who work for a living, I think, resonate with everyone more than politicians. One of the problems we have in politics now, and, and it's a bigger problem now than ever, is you really have a lot of politicians uh, that have never had a job. But it's true. Like, if you look at their, if you look at their resumes, it's, it's the one area where I would say half of the cabinet are loath to discuss. Like if they see a journalist going, bringing the conversation into that area, like, so what did you do for a living before you did this? They get very nervous because a lot of them have never done anything else. You know, um, John Beard, who's a fine fella and a very successful, uh, you know, cabinet minister, and I think he's doing a good job as a minister of foreign affairs. Uh, I think he would be a better minister of foreign affairs had he ever held a job. He, he's just worked in politics since he's been 16 years old. Literally, that, that's it. Um, Pierre Poiliev, which is, was the, uh, the Prime Minister's former parliamentary secretary, you know, who by all accounts everyone expects will be in cabinet, you know, anytime soon. And uh, I held a contest on the show. Um, asking Canadians to provide evidence that he ever had a job. <laughs> no one could. You know, and, and I'm not saying, you know, more power to them. They, they managed to, you know, create these very successful political careers, but they've done so without ever having a job. That used to be not the way politics was viewed in this country. I mean, public service was something that, you know, people did 30 years in the private sector or 30 years working, and then at a certain point in their life, they thought they could give something back and contribute, and they went into politics. They didn't decide, you know, in the grade 11 student council that they were going to, oh, I'm going to become a professional politician and then that's what they do. If you've never had a, had a job and yet you're flying around in a private jet telling everyone, you know, how, how, how they should live their lives and, you know, the problem with all the, you know, the people who do seasonal work in this country and the, the problem with you and the problem with you and that none of them have ever done anything, yeah, of course it creates a huge disconnect. Yeah. So, so they live in a real bubble. I mean, they're, they're, oh, they all have drivers. And nothing against, you know, because I've shot with the drivers and they're good people and I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want, to, <laughs> want to get them out of work or anything. But, uh, 
you know, that's the first thing they get is drivers. It's very old fashioned. You know, if you go to Bay Street, even, you know, you see the, like, you know, titans of Canadian industry. Most of them walk to lunch. They don't actually have drivers. Most Canada people drive themselves to work. For sure. Yeah. Oh no, not if you're not if you're Peter Kent, <laughs> Minister of the Environment. For sure, yeah. You need a yeah. You have a chauffeur like Mr. Lodge does in the Archie comics. <laughs> yeah, it's a completely disconnected with reality. I think you know we've just gone through this exercise of the omni omnibus. Uh, budget, yeah. and I think that uh, it's disingenuous to accuse the conservatives of being the first people to do this. You know, all governments do it, but anyone who watches this business realizes that it's it's like you know there is a uh, a car heading towards a cliff, but you know, okay, there's lots of room until we hit that cliff, but we're just getting closer and closer and closer to the cliff with every one of these omnibus bills. And pretty soon, we're going to go off the cliff and democracy will cease to exist. I mean, what, we're, what we have now is we will have a situation where a government will be elected and the 308 members of parliament, whose job it is, is to, you know, to vet legislation, to debate legislation, to vote on legislation, to, to see how our money is being spent, they, they will, their, their jobs will cease to exist. They will be of zero importance. And one guy, the Prime Minister, will just bring in one bill and it will contain hundreds and hundreds of changes to Canadian laws. No one is aware of what it is. It's never debated. Boom, goes through. Everyone else goes home for four years. I mean, in, the, in, you know, in this budget bill, you know, Jim Flaherty says anyone who's against it is against Canadian jobs and it's all about the economy. Well, that's fine, but why in this budget bill is there, is there legislation that allows the FBI to operate on Canadian soil as law enforcement officers? As a sovereign nation, we have never even entertained such a thing. Now, maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe it's some, an idea that time has come, but it's an idea that should certainly be discussed, and certainly members of Parliament should be aware of it. No one really knows what this means. Does it mean the FBI can just come across the border and come in here and arrest someone and take them back to the States? Or does it mean they have to be with the RCMP? Do they have to inform the RCMP? I mean, I'm not saying, again, it's a bad thing. It's just something that has to be discussed and looked at, which it's not. And then, you know, I was particularly interested in changes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, fish habitat laws. You know, I come from Newfoundland. It's like, you know, science, science, you know, has been ignored too many times when it comes to the fishery. And, and there's all these changes to the fish habitat laws. And I asked, a number of conservative MPs, like, why is this in there and what does it mean? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about fish. Right, but you'll be, you'll be supporting it. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't. I'm part of the party. Sorry, I don't know anything about fish. Yeah. It's not a radical concept that in a budget bill, there should be items pertaining to the budget. But there's lots about the country that makes me optimistic. You know, I, uh, I think, you know, in the last election we had the vote mobs and I thought that that was tremendous and I think that young people are are engaged and they mightn't be engaged in the political process as we know it. And I would like to see them more engaged in our process. But uh, no, I'm not, a, I'm not a pessimist, but, uh, but I, you know, I don't like seeing the country divided the way it's becoming and uh, so, you know, it depends on my day, I suppose. But generally, I'm an I'm a optimist by, by nature. Politicians should ignore young people at their peril but at the same time, I understand why they do it. It's because young people don't vote. So, you know, they, they shouldn't be surprised if they're ignored. I mean, you know who they care about, the senior citizens. And again, nothing against senior citizens, God love them. But a politician who's running in a riding, they look at the breakdown, and they could have a, a university campus sitting in the middle of their riding. And what's more important are those three senior citizen homes, because they know everyone in those senior citizen homes are going to vote. And I've talked to politicians and uh, you wouldn't believe how many of them say, you know, oh, and the great thing about old people is even when they say they're not going to vote, they still vote because it's a day out for them. So they have this very condescending view towards them, but yet that's why during an election you'll see them, the, you know, there's no such thing as a politician who doesn't go to a senior citizen's home, but very rare to see one hit a university campus. Well, personally, I, I have advocated lowering the voting age to 16, but uh, I actually think that that would make a difference. It seems to be a fairly controversial notion, but it doesn't bother me. I think, you know, voting is one of those things, it's, uh, it is habit forming. If, if you vote and it becomes something that you, you do, um, there's a greater chance you'll continue to vote through your entire life. If you look at people who, who vote just as part of 
you know, part of their, their life, um, you know, they all report the same thing. Essentially, they, they voted when they were young because it was, con you know, when they were growing up, they had parents who voted and it was explained to them it was very important and quite often they can remember going with their parents when their parents voted and if you get them young, they'll continue to vote. But uh, it's very easy when you're 18, 19 years old to, you know, go off to school or go off to work and then just not pay attention and, yeah, we got to get them when, when they're young. Well, in the last election, one of the, you know, Guelph was a very interesting place. Guelph is going to go down in history as that place where something very funny happened in the last federal election for a couple of reasons. One is that's where the first vote mob was, uh, and there were some very active students. They were a non-partisan group of students, which I thought was pretty exciting. No one could put their finger on them what, what party they were supporting, and, and they kind of went out of their way not to any of their actions, they didn't have any, there was nothing promoting one political party or any anti-government message or anything like that. But then they went to Elections Canada and they wanted, uh, you know, uh, special ballots at the, uh, at the university and Elections Canada said fine and they put the ballots there as they should because in fact, again, going back to the senior citizens homes, Elections Canada puts ballots in senior citizens homes all across the country. I mean, really, anywhere where there's a group of people who want to vote, they should put a ballot. And a university campus is a perfect example. And of course, all hell broke loose because we had this young man who's now, you know, uh, well known because of his alleged involvement in the robo calling. Um, you know, he went, he was, you know, working with the local conservative campaign. He went completely batshit and tried to actually seize the ballot box in his capacity as a guy who knows the prime minister, I suppose, but certainly not a law enforcement officer. Um, people got really nervous really worried that, what, what is this? Elections Canada going to start putting ballots where university students are? This is, this is not good. Well, of course there should be ballots where university students are. You know, one of our most cherished freedoms is, and everyone understands it, you know, the freedom of speech and the freedom of opinion and, um, you know, when you have it and I have it and the cab driver has it and the lobster fisherman has it, you know, and that's one of, you know, the things I love to do more than anything is sit around and, you know, talk about what's going on, everyone has an opinion and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, MPs now um, are different, they, they don't have that. They, they just have to check with head office. It's, uh, that's a very unfortunate circumstance.